And now we fast forward to the late 19th century and Zainab Yabachi, who is now one of us living in London but has lived in Damascus, Rome, and Istanbul before, is going to talk about Italians and the properties, particularly in late 19th century Istanbul. And before I forget, these books of earlier <coughs> conferences are on sale tonight. Jeremy's lovely pictures. I think this should look very refreshing. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, about cultures, how you ended up showing portraits, whereas I have just pictures of papers and building, because, you know, why is it haram? You know, what is it forbidden in Islam? I mean, it shouldn't, but, you know, maybe that's why I'm, I'm not using any portraits on my face. So today, uh, some of you know me, I'm one of the trustees of the uh, LHF, and, uh, but I'm going to talk about Italian property uh, petitions in Istanbul at the end of the uh, 19th, beginning of 20th century, but it's more of a personal story, hopefully encouraging you, uh, shall I? Hopefully encouraging you to, uh, is that working? Yeah? No? I don't think you need it. That's okay. Your voice yeah. is strong enough. Okay, all right. Uh, what it is that, uh, you know, I'm a yet another PhD student who's over enthusiastic about her subject. And I'm expecting all of you to be as excited as I am. <laughs> so embrace yourselves. Uh, but I wish I could say that I have chosen my PhD subject, but it was the other way around. It really came and found me. I was looking for like every other researcher an unexplored and very exciting and crucial thing. And uh, another friend from Istanbul, she suggested I go meet this second-hand book dealer who has an immense archive on the Italians of Istanbul. And I was intrigued and met him immediately. And since today, I have no idea if he's lying or if he's telling the truth. But uh, basically what it is that he has sacks and sacks of material, which he says that it was dumped into the trash found by a paper recycler who was smarter than the person who dumped them to the trash, obviously, and he decided they would, you know, they, were, they are worth more as documents than as ju junk paper. So he, they ended up in the secondhand book dealer. Who doesn't know any Italian, English, <laughs> French? He's an expert on Ottoman script. He knows Arabic, but no Western languages. So he had no idea what these documents were. And what are, what are they? They were uh, really a mishmash of everything, notarial acts, court cases, uh, you know, just thrown probably from the summer residence, residence in uh, Terapia, Tarabia, of the Italian uh, <coughs> consulate. Probably somebody in Rome said, get rid of them, and they just dumped it in the trash. So I told him, if you let me look at these material, and if I find Zonaro's or any other you know, prominent figures' uh, papers, I'll let you know, and you know, meanwhile, I'll get to look at them. And I thought I will be able to go back again and again. So I just chose seven out of the 40 or 50 sacks, uh, and just you know, kept opening and scanning and then closing. And then I saw these papers that were enough to build a PhD. So I said, oh, I'll just consistently copy these. But I had no idea what I was copying at the time because I really didn't have time to read altogether. And I was allocated this tiny desk. Yeah, this is seven years ago. And you know, at that time, didn't know that I was, you know, going to save this archive just 
looking at them. Uh, but basically, what, what I ended up uh, scanning was the property petitions. So if you were a foreigner in Istanbul, in, in the Ottoman Empire, you had to bring an identity you know, card from, not, not a card letter, from your consulate saying, this person, so and so a son, and, and he's that person who he, he claims to be, and he's alive, basically. And if you had to do any kind of property transaction, inheritance, selling, uh, buying, a changing of status, you had to bring this letter from your consulate. So, uh, and this is important because be the land registry office in uh, Turkey, in the, the Ottoman records and the modern Turkish records, are close to public, even to researchers. And in my view, in a lot of researchers' views, they will stay closed because there are so many contested issues, like what happened to the Armenians, Greeks, who left the country without selling their properties. They're all confiscated, became public buildings. If you open Pandora's box, there is no end. So nobody is allowed. So we, unless you are an interested party, a descendant, you're not allowed to go look at the title deeds. So this large community, which numbered 14,000 people, uh, by 1906 uh, had a lot of properties but we have no records of this other than this, the documents that I scanned and uh, anybody who studied a little bit of uh, you know, property in the Ottoman Empire it's a very very complex issue uh, and I'm bringing you yet another this is the lovely building where we had the, the 2014 conference, the uh, British consulate building in Istanbul. And imagine this. I'm coming to you and I'm telling you the ground that the Buckingham Palace is standing doesn't really belong to the British, you know. It's the title deeds are there, but they're not registered for under the name of the English government or the Queen is registered an Ottoman citizen who has some Italian descent, you know, descendancies from uh, Pisa originally many centuries ago. And that's it. Like, this will be shocking, but that was the case. And it was quite late, actually. Uh, here we have a uh, memorandum written by uh, two Greeks, you know, Greek, uh, probably Greek citizens who were working as translators in the English uh, embassy uh, dating 1889 because they received the English received a letter from the Ottoman state saying uh, there seems to be some issues with your title deeds you know uh, that the, the embassy is standing on and the, that building is completed the construction is completed 1853 so this is almost you know 40 years later, uh, you don't, you know, who owns the land? You know, this is like, you have to sort it out. And then I'm really feeling sorry for these middlemen who are trying to explain the whole history back to the, you know, foreign office uh, people in London because they are not getting it and they're sending one memorandum after, look, this is easy. So uh, it's not easy at all because, of course, the main problem is the uh, main categories of land in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, most of, uh, private property was an exception rather than the rule. Like, it's not a, I'm not talking about freehold, leasehold, because when it is leasehold, there's someone who, who owns the lease or who owns the land. It's not like that. Most of the land was owned by the state, which could be also the, you know, that time's sultan's private property, which could become religious endowment the next day, uh, but you could rent the religious endowment land and pay a fee and keep it as a private property. Your descendants could inherit it. So the categories are amazingly complex. Uh, and uh, what is our, uh, 
confusing that any institution or a, a, you know government they cannot put their institution's name into the title deed. So all the churches, all the company lands, all the government lands has to be registered under a private name, a private person's <coughs> name. So you have, let's say, a, you know, Italian missionary from a small town in Italy, he becomes a Catholic priest sent, sent to Istanbul, and he becomes a head priest. So the church title deeds has to be registered under his name. And when he dies, they have to find the nephews and nieces back in Italy, get letters from each of them, and uh, saying that this land did not actually belong to the priest, but he was the trustee, so then it's registered back to the next head priest, and then when he dies, the drama <laughs> continues. So it was the same with the embassy land, and uh, you know, they're trying to explain uh, so this the size is quite sizable property actually, and uh, most of it was the mood, private property uh, type of land, and it was registered under the name of Frederick Pisani, who was this Italian, originally Italian, uh, Ottoman citizen. He was born in Istanbul, and uh, he never claims to be British. He was always Ottoman. You know, he was. Uh, under the British protection, but uh, he, he sues times at one point, and there, you know, he's accused that he can't even sue because he's not a British citizen. He can't, you know, start a court case in London. And he, even then, he doesn't claim I'm British, you know. He says, yes, but I've been serving the British government, and the slander to my name is done in London, so I can uh, start the court case. He loses at the end. But uh, so the land is registered under his name because he he's Ottoman and the foreigners were not allowed to have property at this point. And uh, the uh, another um, you know small amount is registered under the uh, name of the wife of the late uh, William James Smith, who was the architect of the British Embassy at that period. So they're saying basically you have to find this wife if she's alive or if she's dead you have to find the heirs and get the letters saying that she's not the owner nor Frederick Pisani we have to find his heirs too and they should confirm that the land indeed belongs to the British government but then again still at this point or till up to the Republic you wouldn't be able to register it what they are suggesting we can register it under the name of the present, you know, consul or ambassador, and once he goes, he'll just transfer it. And they're saying, but then we have to pay fees, and certainly it is a ruse that the Ottomans are after to get more, you know, precious sterlings out of us. So this is just like, you know, and a little type, uh, 1,000 square meter is uh, Wakaf land, which is religious endowment land. And this one is registered uh, under Frederick Pisani and five other Muslim citizens. And you can see up uh, at the bottom of the first paragraph the names Sabih Effendi, Aisha Hanum, Hatar Ibrahim. These are the people who own the title deed for the British uh, embassy land. And, uh, you know, and they're trying to explain. This is like a 20 page letter from the uh, queue, National Archives in queue. And you know, and the people in London, they just don't get it. And in the end, they say, just let's leave it. You know, <laughs> if we can get away with it, uh, try to figure what the Ottomans want. They want more money probably, but they're not gonna take away. So, you know, pretend we didn't hear anything from them. Basically, this is what the, you know, missile is saying. Uh, but uh, the documents I am working are similar, bear in mind all those complexities. But what I have is uh, 1,200 petitions uh, written by Italian citizens, who were, some of them were not even Italian. I mean, they acquired Italian citizenship 
uh, for example, a lot of Jewish people, when they uh, were exiled from Spain, they briefly stayed in Italy and entered Ottoman Empire through Italy, and they have Italian citizenship because of that brief uh, passage, but they've never been to Italy, they don't have any relatives there, they don't speak Italian, but still they are considered Italian citizens because you know, they have the passport. So uh, our, uh, a period uh, starting from 1873 when the Italians were granted to own property in the Ottoman Empire, and I'm ending uh, my uh, research 1910 uh, before the Anglo-Turkish War starts, just you know because once the war starts, they're all exiled and it gets all complicated. <laughs> and most of the documents that were thrown uh, ends with 1910 anyway. And uh, in total, we know. Uh, I'm estimating, we don't know, but it is a very good estimation. There are 4,300 petitions. We know because uh, the editor of the uh, Rasegna Italiana, the uh, uh, Italian Chamber of Commerce uh, official bulletin, he sees these registers uh, that are held in the embassy about all these petitions. Every day they recorded, say, Today we received this petition regarding the property cases. So he saw the file, uh, and I asked uh, Emanuele, she's here, uh, and her father is related to the uh, Italian uh, consulate in Istanbul, and I asked her, I can't go in, they won't let me go in. You should ask them if this register is around, but so far we, you know, uh, we don't know if it's still around or not. But basically, out of this 4,300, I managed to scan uh, 1,200 of these petitions. And these petitions are giving, what kind of information they are giving? They are giving uh, the address of the property. Uh, if it is a house, in this case, you know, it gives you the exact address. And its value, and uh, what type of transaction it is. It could be buying. And then, if you're lucky, we will see 20 years down the line for selling. And you can look at the prices and build some uh, data about the property prices. And uh, it's giving us information about family relations. And uh, it's very common you would have one member of the family, Italian, and marrying to a English family and the other daughter marrying to a Bel Belgian family. So you have all these uh, family trees. Because it's an notarial act, you will have everybody, you know, so this is married to this person. And when we don't have the family trees, that can come handy. But this is quite late, late <coughs> period, so generally we do have uh, better knowledge through the church records. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is human drama. and. Uh, what sort of petitions there are. Of course, there are, you know, most of them are very boring. But then you have uh, very, you know, fun uh, information such as old men, you know, becoming widows, and they want somebody to take care of them. So they take these new younger wives to the consulate and they are made, uh, registering the house under, you know, the new wife's name with the condition they should take care of them till they die. Yes. Uh, or, you know, you have like few cases of uh, very prominent families, actually. A young, crazy woman being locked up in mental institution, <laughs> and the father, brother, or uncle is, the, uh, is in charge for the, uh, for the properties. And I chose few, you know, few other, like more uh, colorful, uh, samples, and this is a petition given by Joseph Floriani, he's an accountant, and his wife was Greek, and it's stated uh, 1872, he's not buying, he's renting a property, he gives us the address, and uh, telling us from whom he rents, and basically what happens is that uh, he's petitioning the consulate and, you know, the municipality as well, uh, because the sister-in-law was living with them temporarily, because the brother-in-law 
these are Greek citizens, was in jail. But then he comes out of jail and he moves in with them as well. And it was supposed to be temporary, but you know, it's true that they're not going anywhere and they're <laughs> not paying the rent. So he's petitioning them again, because he said, you know, as of my previous petition, he wants them, he wants the Italian consul to do something, because he's Italian, and uh, to evacuate them from the property. So the Italian uh, consul is sending a letter to the Greek consulate. And this is a very, you know, family matter, but uh, the Greek consul intervenes and they get kicked out of the property. So, so this is another petition. Uh, by the residents of the Marguerite Street in Pera, and they're saying, uh, Angelina, and this is in French, I chose French thinking that most people would know French than Italian, uh, but Angelina Barbato, an Italian lady, she was uh, running, uh, and I love the language because my French is not that good, it says Maison de Tolerance. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, a tolerance house, you know? <laughs> it can't be that bad. What, what, what does that mean? Like, why are not, why they are not happy about this? Uh, but you know, it was, it turns out it was a brothel and she was uh, running a brothel from a rented property. And they want her uh, to stop this, but they can't do anything. So they're petitioning. They are not Italians. Some of them maybe, but you know, not all of them. They're petitioning the Italian consul to do something about this. And there was another letter which I couldn't find, but they were saying, giving a second petition and saying, look, if a fire or another wrath of God falls upon us, we know that it's because of this woman, <laughs> and you're not doing anything about it, so it's because of you, kind of very dramatic uh, accusation. So you get all sorts of drama, uh, and you know, I'm very lucky uh, these, these are, you know, I have good scans of them. Uh, the story with the archive is this second-hand book dealer, which we try to intervene by. And then uh, they're skip. he or the owners are scared that they have this material, because, you know, they found it in the trash, but they could have stolen it. And if somebody reports them, they might get into trouble. So uh, mysteriously, another book dealer, second-hand paper dealer, book dealer, bought them from him. And first he was willing to show them to me again, and then he blocked me totally. He won't answer my phones, and you know. And for nights, I wouldn't be able to sleep. Uh, what if, if there's a fire, flooding, what, what happens to these documents? I only opened seven out of the 40. You know, what, all this you know, valuable uh, information, what happens to it? And, and so far we don't know. All we know, I have his number. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on him through Facebook, whatever I can mm -hmm. do. And, and it's nice, you know, I, I, I'm from Istanbul, from Turkey, and we had a big scandal a few months ago everybody's uh, addresses were put online on a Russian server. Like everybody were registered to vote, all your information about your family, your address. And uh, so I said, you know, I'll, I respect people's you know, privacy, whatever. And I told my husband, let's look just for his address. <laughs> I, I, I can't sleep, at least I'll know physically where the documents are. So I have his address and his sister's address, same somewhere. <laughs> uh, but basically, I can't do, like, what do I do? I go to the Turkish police. If he doesn't want to sell, he's not going to sell. But uh, basically, I'm trying to finish my PhD. Then uh, once it's over, hopefully this year, uh, we'll put the whole database on the uh, LHF website and Right now, it is open to consultation. I get requests. They're saying, can you look up for this person if he's Italian citizen? Did he, you know, have any, does he come up in your database? But other than that, uh, we'll put it online and open it to consultation. So that's it. And hopefully, one day, we'll have the whole archive if, you know, nothing happens to it. Cross our fingers. 
Sengi. Well, thank you very, very much, Zena, for reminding us how complicated property rights in Istanbul are. Two tour de force really showing uh, this incredible interaction between the Ottoman Empire and England and Italy. Now, any questions before we go up for dinner? I have one question yes. about the missing documents, but apart from the obvious fact that the book dealer obviously wants to sell them to somebody, so that's a question of finding the right person to buy them from him. But the, qu the question is this, you've got the Italian documents, but presumably all the foreign embassies have equivalent documents um, in their archives. They might, they, be, I know, um, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Michelle, yeah. I know they do, because in these letters, you, if the siblings had different citizenships, you keep having the same reference. We also sent, or we also applied to the uh, British consulate, and uh, taken advantage of the fact that we had our conference in the British consulate. I, you know, I had the secretary's email, so I said, can you just look up your archive and nothing, you know, I don't know. If it is uh, physically, it was in the building in the Italian case. Uh, in the English case, we, we know with Cray, like things are getting destroyed, com you know, constantly. One of the, you know, purposes of LHF, if we could get our hands on any kind of material, it might look you know, not important, but uh, it should exist. I don't know if it still does. Mm -hmm. It's not here in the tube, not in the National Archives here. But uh, I don't know where to look otherwise. Yes. Did you have a chance maybe to look at the real names of these streets today? Yeah, yeah. And whether the buildings the owners of these build, like the buildings of themselves, still exist, and were you be yeah. were you able to go yeah. to the uh, planning and so on? Yeah. To see? Uh, what I did for a previous conference, I did. Uh, I can't do all of them. Ideally, I should do all of them. It's only 1,200 addresses. But uh, I started with a specific family, like Corpi or the Andrea Tubini, and made a list. And in some cases, yes, the buildings are standing. And because we have the insurance maps, I can still locate the building. Although the street name and the numbers change, the plot didn't. And Google Maps, you know, the satellite view is showing me exactly the same plot, same house. And I mean, these are quite recent dates, you know, not like Tudor dates. <laughs> so sometimes they do stand. The Tarlaba should be pulled out right now. A lot of properties are destroyed, mm -hmm. but uh, some of them I managed to photograph. Yeah. Can we not all petition? Mm -hmm. Can we not? Can we not develop a pressure group petition? Mm -hmm. Push the not in up. Turkey. Mm -hmm. Have you met our president? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I haven't. All questions. <laughs> yes, over there. Um, I think uh, you mentioned that uh, there are some. Uh, the Turkish authorities are hesitant, or the law is hesitant, to give access to archive, yeah. as it may open <coughs> Pandora's box by endless requests yeah. on properties. Yeah. We're talking of uh, documents which are 100 years old. Isn't yeah. there a concept of prescription that after some time you can no longer claim properties, and this would make it more available for research, is that, yeah. that there's nothing at stake anymore? Therefore, yeah. it can be researched and accessible. Isn't there like a law of prescription, or are you aware of it? No, no. <laughs> but I'm doing the Turkish way. I befriended a person <laughs> who works there, and you know, I'm called. I'm grooming him. That's the word. Yeah, I'm grooming him. So I'm hoping. I'll just tell him. Not all of them. Just you know, look at this. For example, the the uh, Corpi Palace, which was the American. Uh, you know, embassy, consulate, then later consulate. And it's quite a public building, and we know that the Corpies owned it, but among those petitions that you know, I managed to scan, the, the buying of the land, not the house they built, 
but it didn't surface. And a particular lady was writing a book on this building. She was like, that's fine. So I was like, I'm grooming specifically for this reason. I'm just going to say, just this public building, which belongs to the Americans anyway, we can't make claims on them. Can you tell, look up and tell us what year at least what was built? And if something built, when was it built and when was it registered? You know, it's very frustrating, but I don't think that it's ever going to happen. Not, not with the title deeds. The archives are open, if you know the language, but not, not the title deeds. Yeah. Yeah, just as an answer to that question, actually, I know that um, in 1945, there were a few families who went to Israel, mm -hmm. from, and they had properties in Galata, and now their nephews are coming back and sort of claiming the property, and they're actually having more luck than Maybe the left Theoretically, if it is not public land, you know, if it, the state confiscated Noah, you're never going to get it back. But if it is in the hands of someone else, you might start a court case and win it back. You know, if you never sold it and you can prove that you never sold it, and you are the heir from the fifth generation, doesn't matter. The law recognizes it as yours, and you know, you might have a case. Mm -hmm. A question over there, <laughs> Caroline? Uh, is there any possibility of gaining corroborative uh, evidence from newspapers? I don't know whether um, newspapers are yet digitalized in Turkey. Um, you might have it. I have some clipping. If it was a big plot of land, yes. of value, they would say, and especially if it was auctioned. Then again, remember, private property is the exception rather than the rule, so that those lands are rare. Yes. Uh, you would have, you know, a document of it's belonging to a certain family. But uh, other than that, newspapers won't help us. You know, with the properties. The question well, can I just make a comment rather than a, a question? Because you mentioned the British records and the <laughs> when you were in uh, Istanbul. <coughs> um, I'm working on a 19th century console, and my experience is that virtually all the day to day documents, the internal documents, mm -hmm. people registering at the console and all of that, yeah. that's all gone. They've destroyed, yeah. they've never kept it. I mean, we all love. The National Archives of Kew is a wonderful system, but a huge amount was weeded out before it got to Kew. So the correspondence between embassies in London and consulates in London is all there, yeah. but not the internal consular paper. Yeah. And I, my guess would be, but obviously I don't know, is that all that sort of record, together with all the other stuff about yeah. citizen registry of consulates and, yeah. and protected persons, was all destroyed at some point along the line. Just to yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, it's my dream, like these registers are surfacing. I have found about five years, four years worth of those internal documents, which for some reason I can't explain, survived from the late 1860s for the consulate in Cyprus. But working over other consulates over a period of several decades, I've not found anything of that kind. Yeah. Over there, um, question about uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> As to whether there are any sort of soft Brexit in the New England who rather disapproved of this outreach to theoretical terms. Yes, sir, any. Some soft Brexiteers who <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, what's interesting is that the story, of course, ends. I, I stick with the Elizabethan period for very specific reasons. It's a polemic, but it's also because, of course, as soon as Elizabeth dies in 1603, James comes to the throne. And then it is a real interesting Brexit moment because James says, We can't sustain this level of political and commercial and theological isolation. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the book, and it's uh, Mac and I have a sort of debate about. The, the, the picture of the treaty with the Spanish, um, which is to basically allow the English back into Europe. And it's a great moment because James effectively is saying, we, we can't keep doing this. So there's a way in which the Anglo-Islamic alliances are sustaining to some extent, but it's just not going to work. It's just not, it, it's not sustainable. And it's one of the first things, of course, that James does. And that is a moment, and I've written about this around Charles I's art collection and what then happens 
with the cultural impact because it's, it's the first vestiges of the Grand Tour. Cheney's written about this, that suddenly the English are allowed to travel within that European domain. And so the trail goes cold in a sense on particularly the Anglo-Turkish and Anglo-Moroccan alliances because it's just not really needed anymore. So, of course, the trade carries on, but the way in which that's been a kind of extraordinary fusion of, of politics and commerce goes cold. Um, but yeah, absolutely, of course, there's huge debate. <coughs> Again, all I suggest in the book is that we've tended to find what we wanted to find, which is presumably an approach to the Levant or anything further east, which is simply either exotica or incomprehension. And yes, of course, there is that, and there's a theological uh, issue which sort of says, no, this is absolutely terrible, and we're all being going to be murdered in our beds by the Turks. But that is one strand of a wider conversation that's going back right to the 1520s, when there's a sense of, is there a, a, a rapprochement that may happen here? Because nobody knows how that Reformation moment is going to play out. So yes, of course, there are those uh, different voices which have drowned out the kind of exchanges that I'm talking about, where, of course, trade and diplomacy trumps theological absolutes. But I just want to say those voices are there, and that's why you see the drama being so ambivalent. You know, I was just, with my other hat, working with, uh, down in Bristol at Tobacco Factory, with uh, a theatre company who was saying, we want to do a production of, of Othello, which foregrounds his kind of Islamic heritage. He's a convert from Islam to Christianity. And that's the way in which they're trying to play it. And I'm saying, yes, because all the literature, all the culture was full of that throughout the 1590s. And it's just been hidden in plain view. And I think, again, it's, it's a different notion of, of the materials that you work with here. When I work with drama, I say, drama is not interested in saying good or bad. It's interested in saying, isn't a figure like a Turk or a Moor fascinating? Because at this point, we don't know whether there are salvation or they are going to murder us in our beds. And both those kind of discourses are at play in this period. So yes, they are both there, but I just want to still offer a bit of a corrective to say there are many different responses to it, some of which are completely uninterested in the theological dimension. So do the we lovely weapon sales to the Ottoman Empire, does that stop in yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, because James, of course, is taking a very different line because he believes that he's the great Irenic salvation of, of, of what's happening in Europe. It's complete nonsense. But yeah, absolutely, it stops. Now, of course, the East India trade goes on, as, of course, does the Levant trade. But that moment where this is, as it were, state-sponsored or with close state support, no, that goes completely. And this is a comment, actually, not a question, but um, something happened to me in the spring. It was kind of a miracle. Your book came out, and I read it, and I read Philip Mansell's Levant. So it just basically fell in, you know, on top of each other so nicely. We often fall on top of each other. Matt shaking his head. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and, and thank you. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely moment because, you know, Philip has been doing this work for a long time. Mac has been doing this work for a long time. And in that mainstream field in which I work within the humanities and talking about the high renaissance, this material has completely been occluded. It's completely just been marginalised. And it's only because of people who've been doing this work for a long time. I mean, I've been doing it for some time, but they've been doing it for even longer. And doing that kind of close archival work. And the skill sets that's required, very, you know, in terms of how we're moving across the vernacular languages, and also working in oriental languages, which you know, I'm the first to say, I'm not trained in that discipline. I'm discerning and saying it's a similar thing about what are the archival traces that are left. And I think that there are more. But of course, the problem that we have is what you were touching on is the political difficulties that we now have. If I say, I want to work with Turkish, Iranian, Moroccan, Algerian, uh, uh, Egyptian scholars, over to Philip about how impossible that is in the current climate. That's the difficulties that we have from an English humanities tradition, which comes out of a Greco-Roman tradition, yeah, so that we do have a tradition of Greek and some Latin, but we don't know how to look at those letters from Murat, because that's just not our training. That's why you have organized. You read that poem for us. Yeah, I know exactly. You know, this is why this is why you have organizations like this. I mean, seriously, this is why it's great to do it because you say I can speak to an audience that gets much of that material in a way that for the last year I've been giving it to English audiences who just go, "Whoa, I don't know any of this." 
Anything is possible in London. Anything is possible. <laughs> anyway, thank you both enormously for opening our eyes to two new aspects of the Levant. And see you all again in April.